All right, so I think it's time we can start. It's 5.05. Hi everyone, welcome. And thank you for joining to another ACE, New York City ACE, what we are conducting today. And uh, one thing is like we just started the recording. So this session is being recorded so that it can be shared later on with everyone and also to some people who couldn't make it today. Um, just as an introduction part, I'm Kapil Samadhya. I'm one of the co-lead for the New York City ACE. It's been like more than a year for me uh, as a co-leader. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, with me, there is uh, Dilip and Madhu, a well-known face to you guys uh, with the co-lead for New York City ACE for a while. So they're gonna be working in background with a lot of stuff today and helping me out. Uh, uh, if you see about the agenda, so we are going to have a two great talk today. Uh, one is by Himanshu from EdTech on the migration tools from server to data center. And uh, then we're going to have Sean and Ryan from Adoptivist with a very interesting uh, presentation on Agile Manifesto. Uh, other than that, there's, uh, there are raffle and I'll just quickly go through that. But there's one thing we added to agenda this time. And that's, that's what we are trying for based on the feedback that we are gonna continue this session, uh, not as in session, but this uh, uh, event after completion of the raffle and all so that we can have some networking. So this would be like a virtual networking, what we used to have uh, when we used to have the in-person uh, events. Uh, some code of contact, uh, please stay on mute, which you guys are already on mute, so that's, that's great. Um, and then if you have noisy background and also that's, that would be great to keep it on mute. Uh, if you have any questions or something, you can raise your hand and Dilip and uh, Madhu are watching the chat closely. So they, they're going to help out in raising your question and, and help you with that. Um, one thing uh, that's about the survey, you guys must have received a survey email from us. Uh, that is something we're really looking forward to hear the feedback from you guys, from everybody uh, as a member of New York City. Uh, Ace, uh, this is, this is going to help us in making our events better and uh, we're going to get some feedback. Uh, and don't forget there are some gift prizes for uh, as a lucky draw. If you fill out the survey, you are eligible to get these uh, uh, gift cards. The last day is July 30th, so you still have a month. So please feel free to uh, submit the survey. Here's the link, and I think uh, Dilip or uh, Madhu is also going to put it on the chat. So you can just either you check the old email or you just um, pick the link from the chat and just get the survey. Okay. Now, here's the important piece about the sponsors. Uh, we really, really uh, very help, uh, thankful always to all our partners who always sponsor our events, uh, especially in this um, situation, all the virtual events are, they are sponsoring all the gift cards. So a big thanks to uh, EdTech, Adoptivist and Column. Uh, today, for today's raffle, we are going to have uh, two uh, $25 Uber gift cards from Column, uh, one uh, $1.50 gift card from EdTech and $50 gift card from Adaptivist. Uh, the, the raffle is gonna have pretty after the second talk, so pretty end of the event. So just note that you have to be there uh, in order to get that. Uh, and also we'll call your name, you just acknowledge by either unmuting your mic or just put it in the chat. And also we would be needing your email address because uh, that's where we're gonna connect you with the partners and then you can get your cards. We had like four, lucky winners last time and their names. So congratulations to uh, all of them for uh, getting the, being the winner from our last event. Uh, online community, you guys know most of you are already there, but if in case if you guys are here, um, then definitely please do visit and um, join online community. It's, it's fun and there are a lot of information, discussions over there. And there's also like uh, one part from the Atlassian um, job and career side as well. Uh, I actually missed one thing to ask in the, during the introduction. That's what I just want to ask now. You can raise your hand or unmute your mic or say, do we have any first timers uh, members who are joining our 
uh, event for the first time. You can you can unmute and speak up. You can raise your hand or just put a chat. Okay, maybe all our familiar face, no new people. Uh, all right, so I'll just move forward. Uh, here is the upcoming events. As you know, that Atlassian is doing a lot of webinars and they are doing online, they're posting them online and live. So there is a link over here. Uh, you can get the list of all uh, webinars over there and you can join whatever is, is interesting uh, to you. In terms of like next, uh, next uh, online and virtual ACE, uh, we decided the date is July 30th and we're gonna have a great uh, talk. One of the talk for sure, which is mentioned here from Steve and Fletcher uh, about the, uh, from the Atlassian product suite. So this is, this is you can mark your calendar and we gonna, you're gonna receive an email shortly uh, from us uh, for the event registration. All right, so I think here is, we are at the point uh, to kick off our presentation. Uh, in between, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, you can put it on the chat and right after the presentation, we'll open the floor for any question answer where you can unmute your mic and ask any question question to the uh, to the presenter. Uh, for the first talk, we are having uh, the talk from Himanshu. Himanshu is CTO uh, of EdTech uh, and he always presented multiple times earlier too. Um, EdTech, you guys, probably at least everybody who's coming in, in the event definitely knows and everybody missed that part about the sushi. There are great sushi uh, sponsors all the time. So once again, thank you for that. And uh, from here onwards, I think I'll hand it over to Himanshu. So I hope you're ready, right? So I'll just uh, stop my presentation so that you can start and uh, floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you for the intro, Kapil. And mm -hmm. I certainly miss the sushi as well. You know, so hopefully we can get back to that sometime. Um, let's see here. And... All right, hopefully, all right, we should have that up now. Yep. And uh, thank you everyone for joining um, joining uh, us in this uh, presentation today. And today I I'll talk about uh, you know, some tips that I've learned over the years helping our customers migrate uh, from different environments and specifically from the uh, Atlassian server products to data center. Uh, there have been some learnings that have that you know we have acquired as well as our customers have acquired. Uh, some of these learnings have been nice and smooth. Others have been a bit painful. But it's always you know nice to look back in retrospective and see um, you know what you can do better for future migrations if you are tackling those yourself. Um, so AdTech is a platinum solution partner. You know we have uh, offices in multiple locations in the U.S., uh, India, and Singapore. But like everyone else these days, you know, we are mostly a remote company. Uh, I think everyone is thrust into being a remote first company at this point. Um, and, um, you know, going back to our topic at hand, um, you know, Atlassian has released a couple of data center products over the years. Uh, they started with Jira and Confluence data center, and then next came Bitbucket data center. And then, you know, customers also mentioned that, hey, um, we can't have crowd be the single point of failure uh, if all the other products uh, uh, have high availability because of data center. And then, you know, eventually they also release the cloud data center. Um, if we look at the remaining uh, server products, um, there are other tools uh, like Fisheye and Bamboo that don't have uh, data center versions available. So currently it's, you know, Jira Software, Service Test, Confluence, uh, Bitbucket, and Cloud. Um, so the first thing you know we should uh, probably address is why migrate from server to data center, and uh, you know you may or may not need to consider this migration path. Um, and one of the key reasons why a lot of um, our customers have considered migrating to data center is because there is a better architecture uh, that uh, allows for scalability on data center. And Atlassian server products themselves have improved uh, the performance and scalability quite a bit over the number, of, you know, over the last couple of years. If you look at some of the release notes, uh, you will see that even the server version of, of tools like uh, Jira and Confluence have done 
performance enhancements and Atlassian also shares you know, some of those benchmark results occasionally uh, where we can see that the performance uh, enhancements are happening you know, all the time. But uh, when we deal with scale, you know, you, if you are a global organization with thousands of employees, then you need to ensure that the Atlassian tools stay up and running uh, with minimal to ideally you know, very less downtime. And uh, the other is with the increasing number of uh, users using the system, as well as the increasing number of integrations and API usage and customizations, you need the infrastructure, the application infrastructure to be able to keep up. And data center allows you to um, scale, not only by being able to run multiple application nodes, but also there are some data center specific features uh, which can help reduce the, the load overall on your system. Um, and then in terms of the infrastructure choice, um, in the beginning, the only option you had was deploying data center on your you know, regular on-premise environment, or even if you do the data center deployment on the cloud, you had to do quite a, a lot of you know, manual steps uh, because there is a lot of uh, infrastructure that you may need to configure. Uh, but that has changed. Uh, Atlassian provides um, you know, different types of uh, templates for public cloud environments like AWS and Azure. And you can spin up a data center environment with some of the default settings you know, within a couple of minutes. Um, usually you know, you, for a real world production usage, you, you do have to make some changes to those default templates, but at least you know, to get up and running, to get a proof of concept up and running on, uh, on AWS or Azure, um, Atlassian has made it very easy and convenient with the help of these templates. So, uh, in our experience as well, you know, the, some of the early customers who adopted data center um, were mostly in highly regulated environments where they had to run their own infrastructure on premise or in their own physical data centers. And some of those customers still have that limitation. However, um, that is changing quite a bit. Even uh, customers dealing in these highly regulated industries now um, are considering uh, you know, the public cloud. Uh, they, they do apply some of their stringent security and compliance uh, and re regulatory requirements on the cloud, but they are now you know, at a point where they need to utilize the cloud in order to scale, not only for their Atlassian products, but also to stay competitive overall. Um, and then data center also allows you to architect a more resilient architecture, allows you to have more robust uh, disaster recovery and so on. And uh, the Atlassian ecosystem is not just about those great out of the box features, but it's also about the ability to customize. You, know, you could customize Atlassian tools by leveraging the API, but more commonly and more frequently, you might also be customizing the Atlassian tool um, with the help of all of the great marketplace apps that are available. But when you go to data center, you, not, uh, you, you get access to data center verified apps. So these are more battle tested and Atlassian has uh, more strict guidelines in order to uh, make an app data center approved. So by moving to data center, you are also getting access to sort of a more uh, you know, limited, uh, I mean, it's fairly wide uh, range of apps. In fact, all of the most popular and widely supported apps are now data center certified, but it does help you kind of filter out some of the apps uh, that may cause possible side effects of performance degradation if they are not architected for data center and for scalability. Um, and then the other part is that uh, in terms of the login experience, most organizations are now migrating towards uh, the SAML 2.0 standard. Uh, and uh, Atlassian Data Center has uh, support for SAML out of the box. So even in our experience, a lot of customers use the data center migration as also an opportunity to, do, to integrate with SAML. And you know they will use SAML uh, providers like uh, Okta or Secure Auth, and and then they uh, typically also do some of this integration as part of data center migration uh, if they have not already done so. Um, so I mentioned that there are some features in data center that help you scale, and uh, one of those data center. Um, specific features uh, is the CDN or content distribution network. And if you're familiar uh, in general with you know, modern web application architecture, um, you, know, you might be, have heard of or even utilize CDN. And if you have not heard of CDN, um, you know, maybe this, uh, the, the, this image that we have on the slide uh, is a simple uh, visual explanation of how it may work. 
And the idea is that, you know, you have an application, in this case, a data center instance that is hosted in a particular physical location, um, maybe um, in your European office, but then you may be a global organization with users all over the world, spread out across most of the continent. And uh, typically, um, even with fast internet access, you know, still dealing with the laws of physics, that means there is some latency if you are accessing this uh, data center instance or any other web application from, let's say, uh, Asia or a different part of the world. And uh, the workaround for this is that applications have support for content distribution networks where a lot of these front end assets that get loaded when you access uh, web applications and uh, data center can be cached at uh, edge servers. And these edge servers can be in geographical proximity. So a user from Asia can uh, benefit from the, the content distribution network that caches some of these assets on the edge server that is closest to them. So this way, it uh, speeds up the, the front end and the loading uh, experience for the end user, as well as it reduces the overall load on the, the origin of the, the main instance from where all of this data is being provided. So CDN is another exciting data center feature, which was initially introduced for Jira, and then Atlassian has now expanded CDN support for Confluence and Bitbucket uh, data center as well. Um, the other area that uh, we see a lot of customers do, you know, quite a bit of uh, customization um, is the use of uh, the API. And, and this is uh, especially true for uh, Jira, where, you know, they may build a lot of uh, internal uh, customizations or integrations or apps uh, that heavily use the Jira API. And the Jira API is great. It's pretty flexible. It allows you to automate all aspects of Jira. But uh, the one side effect of all of this customization is that it can, again, put some load on your server. And um, Atlassian recently, um, like a few months ago, announced uh, this feature called uh, self-protection or rate limiting for uh, Jira data center. And this feature uh, allows you to identify as well as prevent uh, potential causes of performance deg degradation. Uh, when the REST API is being called too frequently or a large amount of data is being requested. And uh, the way they do that is, you know, you can define the, the rate limit, you know, which can be like a certain number of requests uh, that each node in the data center would process over a certain period of time. And then um, it allows you to also identify, you know, who, uh, who uh, what user accounts are making too many uh, API calls. And in some cases, you may want to just add exemption because these are critical use cases. And hopefully with the use of data center, you are scaling the instance with the help of multiple application nodes. Uh, but it provides this great degree of, of uh, visibility in terms of you know, what is the source of these frequent and heavy duty API usage and uh, whether you want to restrict them or allow them. And in the past, uh, we, we, we had some customer engagements where uh, we, ha we had to do a similar analysis, but because this feature was not available, you know, we had to write some custom scripts that would pass like the load balancer or the web server access logs, and then try to make a determination of, you know, what script or what service is uh, hitting the Jira API too many times. And, and sometimes, you know, the, um, even in general, uh, when we are helping customers review these customizations that uh, the teams may have built over the course of many years, while using the Atlassian tool, sometimes uh, this can be, um, you know, quite an interesting journey where you almost feel like a detective, where you have to figure out, you know, why a certain customization was made and by whom. And especially with larger enterprises with uh, different teams over the course of many years, uh, it, it can be, you know, quite an interesting journey trying to figure all of this out. Um, and you know, there, there are other uh, data center specific features as well. The Atlassian documentation does a great job of documenting those um, and, and those definitely help um, make the point um, to consider moving to data center from the server version of the tool. And certainly if you are deploying a new instance that is going to deal with uh, any amount of scale, you should consider data center as your first option. Um, in, in terms of uh, in some other uh, tips uh, related to the migration that we have uh, gathered over the years, 
Um, if we look at the, the team that is involved, the resources that are involved for the migration, uh, what we found is that you know, typically you, you would um, start the migration project by assuming that you know, you'll have the Atlassian admins, maybe the server admins, and the infrastructure folks uh, involved in the project. And usually you will assume that the, on the infrastructure side of things, you may just have like the, the database team give you a database instance, the load balancer team do this one time, uh, load balancer configuration and so on. But what we found in reality is that you may, um, in some cases expect the, some of these specific infrastructure teams to be a bit more involved than uh, you may originally anticipate. So one example is the load balancer. Um, and and uh, in a lot of enterprise environments, uh, especially on-prem, they may use uh, you know, load balancers like the F5 load balancer. And you have to engage the F5 team to do the necessary configuration for your data center instance. But uh, you know, there may be some amount of debugging involved to make sure uh, this works and you figure out the, the configuration that ultimately works. Um, so, so you may want to, um, at least give the team a bit of heads up that you know, it may not necessarily be a one-time configuration that they would perform on your behalf, but also um, they may need to be sort of part of your ongoing um, team to at least build out the initial proof of concept uh, data center setup and migration. Uh, and then the other is uh, you also need to do an assessment of whether you have internal resources that can execute the migration in terms of setting up the application, uh, migrating the data and then helping with the QA and uh, user acceptance test process. Um, and uh, you may also want to consider that uh, the additional assistance that uh, Atlassian as well as partners like Attic offer. So from the Atlassian side of thing, thing you know, if your organization has access to um, Premier support uh, and TAM, Atlassian uh, technical account manager, TAM services, you know, they can also be very helpful in terms of planning as well as you know in terms of escalating some of the support tickets that may emerge when you are testing and executing your migration and uh, you know documentation i don't think i need to say much about it if you are part of a team that is doing a complex uh, migration you are um, uh, most certainly documenting the, all of the steps and you can also reduce some of the uh, documentation by ensuring that you use automation to the max um, data center setup can be quite involved, especially in terms of you know, setting up the infrastructure, applying the correct configuration at the OS level, and then applying the correct configuration at the application node level, and all of these other moving parts. And the best way to address it is by automating it. You know, there are a lot of open source tools out there that can help with some of the low level um, uh, infrastructure and configuration automation. And then Atlassian themselves provide um, the quick start template for AWS and like a similar template uh, for Azure. So you can use those as starting points. You may need to modify those, but you know, at least uh, your goal should be to get to a very automated setup. Um, and this can help reduce uh, the, the documentation uh, where you, know, you don't need to have like uh, dozens of steps to set up infrastructure. And instead you may have a step that says, okay, run this automation script or automation tool that will do like a bulk of the setup for a particular section. Uh, the other is architecture. Um, and, and this is the part that I get quite involved with uh, when, uh, when I work with a lot of our customers, um, especially in the initial phases, right? So you're trying to determine you know, what kind of database that you want to use for your data center instance, what kind of load balancer you want to use. Um, because Atlassian provides multiple choices you know, for database, you could use Postgres or you could use Oracle. For uh, load balancer, um, you know, if you are an AWS, you might have to use the AWS load balancer. But if you're on-prem, maybe uh, you have to use F5. And then, um, apart from the options that you want to choose as part of the migration team, you may also be limited, or you may need uh, the approval or input from your security and compliance team. So it's best to really anticipate these in advance and uh, you know, loop them into the conversation in terms of you know, brainstorming the proposed uh, data center architecture. And then uh, at the end of the day, you also need to look at what are the services that your teams internally feel comfortable supporting. You know, sometimes you do have to push them uh, if you want to introduce a new technology that they have not dealt with, and, and then they can use their you know, internal assessment framework to determine uh, whether they can incorporate, uh, whether they can allow you to incorporate that in the setup.
So it's, it's, it can make for some you know, pretty interesting conversations overall, but, but definitely you know, architecture is a key piece. And then the other thing is, if you have an existing server instance, you, you may have uh, your, your existing governance structure in terms of you know, how, what is the process you use for upgrade? What is the process you use for installing and testing apps? What is the process for backups? What is the process for disaster recovery and so on? So you really need to uh, you know, revisit all of these processes uh, for data centers. Some of those you can anticipate in advance and some of those you will update as you go through um, the data center migration process. And then, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you really need to strive for an automated setup. Otherwise, you know, it is going to be tedious and painful. And uh, you need to strive uh, for a setup that is as close as possible to a push button setup. And then uh, in terms of testing, you know, uh, ideally you should leverage uh, automated tests if you have uh, the, the resources available who can help build some automated tests. Uh, these automated tests can not only be helpful for the one-time migration, but you can use this as a test suite for future upgrades and future infrastructure changes. Um, it, it's really helpful to have a collection of automated and at the very least have uh, some manual tests that you can execute for uh, these kinds of you know, application lifecycle um, use cases. And then um, it, there are also some ways to do performance tests, uh, especially when you are going to data center, ideally you want to know the baseline of your existing server instance, and then you want to be able to run some performance tests against the data center instance in order to compare and verify that uh, you, you have achieved uh, a, a more robust um, and performant um, setup. So when we talk about data centers, typically we mean the clustered version of data centers where you have multiple uh, application nodes and um, you have more fail safe in terms of all of the uh, components and moving parts in the setup. But Atlassian um, also introduced something called a non-cluster or a single node data center setup. And what that means is that by you know, simply applying the um, data center license in an existing server instance, you can unlock some of the data center specific features that we discussed earlier, like the, uh, the content distribution network feature um, or the Bitbucket you know, uh, repository mirroring feature and so on. Um, so there are these uh, data center specific features. And if you don't want to change your infrastructure right now, but you still want to unlock some of these data center specific features, so in that case, you can leverage a non-clustered uh, data center setup. Uh, but uh, at least so far in our experience, you know, we've not seen customers uh, leverage this feature yet, but I uh, you know, want to still convey that this is an uh, interesting um, option that is available. You know, almost everyone usually opts to you know, do the full setup in terms of uh, going into the cluster data center setup. And in terms of the cluster data center setup, if we look at a very simple uh, infrastructure topology of a data center instance, uh, so you have your load balancer, and then you have uh, multiple application nodes, uh, and then you have the shared database instance, and then a shared file system. And ideally, you want to ensure all of these components are uh, not going to become single points of failure. So if you have a load balancer, ideally you want to ensure that the, um, in, in the public cloud, like AWS is, is configured to be highly available, or if you are using something like F5, you know, typically it should be uh, configured to already be highly available, but you want to know from the, 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 the teams dealing with these infrastructure components, you know, what is the SLA, uh, what is the HA architecture of these components? Same goes for the database. Uh, you don't want to have a data center setup where uh, the database itself is not highly available. So you may need to work with your database team or your cloud team to ensure each of these components are highly available. And uh, like I, I mentioned, you know, Atlassian provides these uh, great templates for uh, public clouds like AWS and Azure. And uh, in our experience, majority of our customers uh, have mostly chosen AWS as their target environment for deploying uh, data centers. And uh, even though you know, these templates are pretty robust, um, most of the time um, in, in these uh, migrations and setups, what we find is that the default uh, template, like for example, the AWS CloudFormation template may not suffice because your security and compliance teams uh, may have specific requirements that the default templates don't address. 
So in that case, you know, these templates usually are pretty flexible where you can change some of these parameters. Uh, so recently for one example is that, um, you know, for the uh, AWS cloud formation template, uh, one of our customers had the requirement that uh, you have to use their hardened uh, um, AMI image for the EC2 instance. Um, so in that case, you know, you, uh, we help them modify the cloud formation template to use that instead of the default AMI um, that the setup would use. And um, if you are a, a shop that's more leaning towards Azure, then you know, Atlassian provides some resources for that as well. And then the next thing is Docker. Um, so at Attic, you know, we have been using Dockerized version of Atlassian 2 for internal development uh, and testing for quite a number of years. We, we were a pretty early adopter of Docker. Uh, but now um, you know, Atlassian also uh, provides official Docker images on Docker Hub for all of the Atlassian tools. And again, in our experience, we've not seen customers uh, use uh, Docker and Kubernetes uh, set up in production that frequently, uh, but that is starting to come up. Uh, and then also on the Atlassian um, community forums, I, I have seen you know, some folks discuss this thing also in a production setting, but at the very least, uh, it can be very uh, useful for a dev test environment, and if you're doing you know, custom app development as well, uh, Docker can be great. And then, you know, I already mentioned uh, this earlier, but uh, on the marketplace, you can uh, look at the data center approved app. So if you're doing the migration from server to data center, uh, if the vendor does not provide a data center compatible version, then you may want to reach out to the vendor. Um, and if they are unable to provide it, then you may need to find an alternative uh, that is a data center approved. And, uh, you know, just winding up a few other tips to, to, to wrap it up. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned the Atlassian TAM service um, that can be very helpful to uh, help you do some strategic planning around data center migration. Um, Attic has been involved in a couple of projects, you know, where we help execute the data center migration. And some of those customers were also subscribed to the Atlassian TAM service. So, you know, we, we uh, also sort of collaborated with Atlassian TAM to help uh, strategize the migration for the customers. Um, and a lot of our um, enterprise customers also subscribe to premier priority support, uh, Atlassian support. And then that can be helpful as well because you know, we've run into some issues where in some cases, you know, it might even be some obscure bug that we discover with the, help of, with the customer while doing the migration. And having this you know, premier priority support can really expedite when we, um, help the customer report these to Atlassian and, and try to figure out a workaround. And um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we, we uh, have definitely executed our uh, fair share of migrations and it's, it's a pretty collaborative effort between us, the customer uh, and Atlassian and all of the other resources involved. Um, so that was it in terms of the content uh, I had for the presentation. I'm not sure if there are any other questions um, that can come up. And then I also have a couple of useful links from that last documentation that can be helpful uh, when you are planning for your data center migration. Um, and I believe the slides will be available on the ACE website for reference. But yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Imanshu. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, that was a great talk on migration because I always get scared whenever I hear, hear migration. It's, it's yeah. always painful. Uh, I'm pretty sure people might think the same. So there might be some questions. So uh, folks, please uh, feel free to unmute your mic and uh, feel free to ask if you have any questions for Himanshu. And I'll check on the chat in case anybody posted anything there. Manchu, I have a question here, kind of the elephant in the room. Sure. Is, uh, do you see everyone getting scared that server is going to go away and Atlassian is pushing <laughs> the cloud? Well, um, I, I think Atlassian has not been shy about promoting cloud. And I, and I think it makes sense, right? Because, you know, we uh, are moving towards cloud everything. And even, um, you know, traditional enterprise that we, we deal quite a lot with, um, they were not as receptive of the cloud, but now, you know, they can't avoid it, right? So that's, uh, they'd be left out of the innovation cycle. However, you know, there are still some uh, specialized use cases. And also there are cases where the customers have built like very deep integration with the APIs and uh, apps in the server and data center ecosystem where, you know, the, it may not be a compelling option for them to move to the cloud. 
Uh, but certainly, there are some areas where Atlassian has, is starting to make it very attractive, uh, especially now uh, with the upcoming uh, enterprise offering in Atlassian Cloud. Uh, but yeah, uh, definitely, uh, if you are looking to deploy a new instance for a sizable uh, user base, you should definitely consider data center as one of the first options for sure. Cool. Thanks, Himanshu. So, sure. uh, okay, so I think somebody is asking on chat. Let me see. Okay, we are getting one question from Alex. Sure. Um, are you seeing something? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. So I see it. So um, I think Alex is asking, is there saying that days of servers are numbered? Yeah. I mean, there is no specific for sure on this. Uh, so it'll be interesting to really watch, you know, uh, what uh, Atlassian does. But I'm I'm sure whatever change Atlassian does, I'm sure in this, there has to be some something great, grateful um, period. And it, it's, uh, I, I don't know if uh, any of you watched the uh, Apple keynote, um, you know, about, about uh, Apple migrating from the Intel um, um, CPUs to their own uh, Apple Silicon. And then even Apple said that, hey, it's going to be a couple of years for this migration period. So hopefully Atlassian will grace us with something similar if they make the decision about server. But you know, server is a sizable use base and I'm sure Atlassian will do something graceful and not, not something highly disruptive. We had Pratima, the, the product manager for cloud on the last talk. Uh, and mm -hmm. she mentioned that internally Atlassian is now uh, doing, using their tools. They're all cloud-based tools. Uh, so they've yeah. internally made them they made the migration as well and i also think what was interesting she said is that the uh, i think this was for jira she said the code base has split now right you yeah know that, I mean? that's a few years ago in fact that was a couple of years ago i remember one of the comments a few years ago where there was a presentation where basically uh, what the you know, atlassian um, resource who was presenting was saying was cloud just needs this faster innovation cycle faster release uh, and and you know more rapid changes to ui and ux Whereas with server and data center, you have to be, be a bit more gentle, uh, uh, historically at least. Uh, you know, that may have changed quite a bit, uh, but yeah, I, I, it's definitely a fork. I mean, it's, 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 there are some areas where it practically feels like a different product right? when you go <laughs> compare uh, server, data center, and, and cloud. Well, thank you, Manchu, once again. Thanks. Yes for uh, taking us through this migration thing. <laughs> uh, also like folks, we always look for uh, for speakers. Uh, so if you have anything in mind, you wanna present or something, so you are always welcome. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of the co-lead if you have any topics in your mind and you wanna present. With this virtual now, presentations are like little short anyways, like 15, 20 minutes. And then that's, you can, you can present a good topic which will be, which can be helpful for all the community members. All right, in the, in the next segment, we are gonna have some interesting presentations. And for that, we have uh, John, who is the co-signatory for Agile Man Manifesto at Adaptivist. And with, with, uh, with him, we have Ryan, who is the service uh, evangelist, uh, again, at Adaptivist. I think both of them together is gonna have a great presentation today. Uh, they already, I, I, I heard that they already have some ideas to have an interacting, interacting session with us. So this is this is gonna be great, and I'm really looking forward for it. So I think over to you guys. Kapil, thank you so much, and Hamanshu, wonderful presentation. You really know your stuff inside and out, my man. So uh, <clears throat> he knows what's going on. Cheers, buddy. Um, so before we get started with John, before before we wheel John out, um, we'd like to know. In the Zoom chat, let us know what what brings you to the Ace, right? Are you an admin? Are you a developer? What do you do? What, what's your role? I like the Kaiser myself, especially one with uh, you know, the everything seasoning on it. That's my favorite role. But uh, let us know in the Zoom chat what your uh, role is. Strangely, um, because I'm presenting with Keynote, I can't see that. I can't open the chat. I can't. Oh, oh, there we go. Where's my mouse? There we go. All right. And then product manager, user, all kinds of Nice. Quick and bottle washer, that's me. <laughs> Hold on two seconds. I'm just going to fix this so I don't have to. All right. So um, thank you so much, everyone. It's great to see you all at the New York AUG. 
Uh, anybody coming in from around the world? I mean, John's in Philly. That's like another planet. <laughs> All right. Um, and yeah, tonight we're here. Someone from Chicago. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Windy City. Represent. Glad to have you in the on the East Coast in a reasonable time zone for the <laughs> evening. Um, so before we get to John, very quickly about Adaptivist, we're like 300 plus uh, app makers, consultants, uh, visionaries, dreamers, um, and the like, who make apps for the Atlassian suite, Trello, and Slack, and offer world-class services to the enterprise and beyond. Um, we're all over the place, but everybody's all over the place. So we are too, with offices ranging from New York to San Diego to London to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where uh, we are ready to take your uh, requests for help and service and get to it. So let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, Agile co-signatory, John Kern. John? Hi. Hi, Ryan. How's it going? And I was virtually uh, at a conference with actually uh, three three other uh, co-authors, and we were in quote unquote in Netherlands, even though I'm still in Philly. And Bob Martin was in Texas visiting his son. James Grenning is it was in Chicago, and er Eri van Benekum, he was the only one that was local in uh, the Netherlands. So does that count? That I sort of what was was kind of in Europe, kind of. Sort of? You know, I'll. Yeah, I'll give that one to you, John. I think you can, if you want to be in Europe, man, you were in Europe today. Yeah. You got that one. I'm wearing this this shirt from like Copenhagen, even though it's Texas barbecue in Copenhagen and awesome beer, McKellar and oh. three, McKellar and three fours, man. Tap, man. like, had to be 50 taps on the wall. It was, it was hog heaven, no pun intended. Ooh That's also a fantastic Black Sabbath song. As uh, as I can attest to, <laughs> and that's the kind of music they played in there was all like late '60s, '70s rock, American American rock. So it was, I was like, "Whoa, this is pretty cool." Yeah, I would probably end up having more than one drink there, John. It sounds like the kind of place I want to go. And yeah. as soon as this is over, let's meet at War Pigs, <clears throat> the whole group, the whole New York City Og. Let's just head over to War Pigs. It'll be great, John. Now, this is a challenge, right? I'm going to challenge you in front of all these people tonight. I'm going to challenge you to tell us a Reader's Digest version of the writing of the Agile Manifesto. Sure. Um, so for those of you that may not have experienced uh, sort of the 20 or 30 year history of, of software development, back before Agile, and Agile is nothing new, right? There's, there's not... It, Frankly, in our industry, there's not a whole lot of new stuff, even though it looks like there's a ton of new stuff. Um, so Agile is not, not like it was uh, some amazing thing that we quote unquote invented, but rather we were combating in some sense at the time, heavyweight process. So I came from a defense department background, mill standard 2167, you know, crazy, crazy huge documents and just stuff that, you know, I'm thinking, if I can get away without doing this and still satisfy the customer, that, that's my angle. Uh, and then I'm, I'm a taxpayer, so I'm saving the taxpayer, which is me, money, for not doing, stu you know, some stupid thing that was in a process written by I don't know who, for what reasons, I, right? So. Yeah. Don't know what, don't know who, why, was, why does it matter? Yeah, so there was a lot of that going on. There was rational unified Rup. People may have heard of Rational Unified Process, Rup. Um, so there's a lot of heavyweight stuff going on. I personally was being, uh, I've been working and mentored by Peter Code, uh, C-O-A-D, not, not C-O-D-E. Uh, yeah, he was my Counts. Close yeah. enough, right? Close he, enough. So Toad Code, yeah. <laughs> Toad Code. Uh, he was, he was a, um, a great mentor and, and at the time we, we, began to do feature driven development and kind of a blend with XP as well. So that, so there was, there were sort of shadow and not so shadow, XP was pretty famous. But there were a lot of other smaller, less well healed, less marketed um, processes that were going on. 
and I think it was Bob Martin, and they had been meeting kind of as an XP group. And I think he sent an email, and I believe maybe Alistair Coburn said, oh, I was thinking of doing the same thing. Uh, can, I, can I add my list of peeps? Um, and so Bob Martin, we basically got, got some emails saying, hey, we want to kind of just get together you know, there's no money, so you know you fly your you fly your butt out here, uh, and we were actually going between Anguilla and Gia, like uh, in the in the uh, Caribbean and um, Salt Lake City or Snowbird. We had, mostly with Snowbird because it's a lot easier to get to. I, the only Caribbean island I was ever at was Anguilla for my honeymoon, so it was like a hop, skip, and a jump to get to this tiny island. So. We ended up, plus it's February, legendary powder. Uh, let's, let's, uh, dude, why wouldn't you? Let's, let's go to Snowbird. So, and plus Alistair said, uh, he and Jim Highsmith live, live there. So he said, I'll take care of all the you know, reservations. I'll deal with the resort. And they're awesome skiers. Alistair uh, is a kick-ass skier. Still, 20 years on, can he yeah, still well, carve I, a mountain? Last time I skied with him was 10 years ago. I put it this way, we, we went up to the top, they headed for for the Blacks. And I'm like, this is like my first run. I'm from Pennsylvania. What the hell do I know about this? <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna go out this, gonna go down this way first. Um, yeah, no, they're, <clears throat> they're real good. So, so that's really, you know, because of Bob Martin and getting a group of people together. And there were some that were invited that couldn't make it. Um, but it really was about what do you all do and how do you do it that's you know what, what kind of patterns can we detect so it's you know certainly for me uh, object oriented right you're always looking for patterns so i remember martin fowler kind of being the you know, first thing we did was express our own um you know i i, I talked about fdd of course kent beck those guys talked about XP. Ari Van Benekum talked about DSDM. I'm like, huh, never heard of that. Some something going on in the UK and in Europe. Um, I mean, I like the I like the acronym, but I don't know what it means. Yeah, I forget. <laughs> um, and then Ken and and it was there talked about uh, Scrum, which I'd never heard of. I'm like, oh. So I have all these notes, and you can go find them. On, you know, I, I can shoot you guys the links, but if you go to uh, Agile, uh, Agile Uprising, uh, there's some, some interviews over drinking uh, of myself, and, and plus I've uploaded some stuff I found in the attic. So we basically See, got it together. Go ahead. John, the, the first time I heard you explain that you were introduced to Scrum at the meeting where the Agile Manifesto was developed, that blew my mind because I had assumed that Scrum came out of the Agile Manifesto and not the other way round kind of right no yeah there's right some, yeah. yeah there was crystal methodologies there was uh yeah <laughs> uh, there was even more that the handful that we basically you know, went over and you know we kind of um even went through some of those you know exercises we'll still do today like i remember some index cards that uh, that martin handed out and i remember writing the word honesty on it like you know just things that it, we threw them on the floor and then you start sorting them. And you know, for me, honesty, coming from the defense department work, it, you know, it was clear. You can't be 10, you know, 80% done. Either you're done with a feature or you're not. There's, there's no partial credit. You know, so it was stuff like that, that the Gantt charts, the, the crazy ways that people thought they could measure project, you know, well, we're, we're, we're 100% through requirements. Great. So how much code you got? None. All right, you got nothing. Uh, all right, so there, you know, that there's a, a lot of elements from my DOD experience that I made sure to, to voice because that was big, huge, you know, big designer front, large projects. So really, how we got together and what we did was essentially synthesize the things that were common about all of these lighter weight methodologies. And initially, that was what the conference was called, lightweight process or something like that and so it wasn't even called agile yet you know and 
as Bob Martin would say, hey, these conferences happen all the time and nothing ever comes up, right? They're usually, you get, you know, he went there, he skied half the day, drank, met the other half the time, sometimes met on the chairlifts too. I just want to point out that that's three halves. Yeah, exactly. Legendary mathematician, John Kern, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yes. It's a <laughs> partial differential equations, yeah. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> Fuzzy math. <laughs> yeah, so, so it was really um, a sharing. And then on day two came some of the beginnings of the now famous four bullets. And just as important, especially, was the humility. Because most of these people never would have gotten together for any other reason, because a lot of them were competitors. A lot of them didn't, you know, were hardcore on their methodology, not someone else's method. All right, so it was an odd confluence of, of chaps that normally wouldn't have rubbed shoulders in that, you know, that big of a group. So it really started kind of on the second day, the synthesis into the now famous bullets. And so beginning on the second day, how many more days were there? This is a kind of a two-part question. So how many more days were there? That was it. Two days. Oh. <laughs> so, so with the, the previous three halves over two days, yeah. man, I suspect you guys didn't sleep a whole lot. Well, we, yeah, we drank. And um, you know, <laughs> I remember, I actually remember sitting down and, and uh, kind of showing uh, Bob Martin how, check this out. Because at that time I was helping build TogetherSoft, a UML modeling tool. Um, you know, so I showed him ways how, how in some sense I, I can build out method all, you know, methods and write the code or write the code and build methods. And, you know, I remember just, we do things like that, even in the off, off time, just kind of get together and, and shoot the breeze about stuff. But really the magic was in the, the fact that we're still, right, it's, it wasn't definitive. It wasn't like, this is the way thou shalt do, you know, it was like, hey, we're kind of, you know, Still learning and exploring about this software thing, and then the the, the left and right on the uh, you know the important phrase at the bottom that said because I'm you know one of the biggest probably very verbose documenters or you know like I make a lot of wiki pages, but I don't want to I don't want to do it for stupid reasons right so prolific so, even yeah especially on you know the, the the things that you can't see in code. So that was the other golden moment is, I'm, I, and I'm not sure who, right? The, the coolest thing about this is, especially because a, a friend of mine that, uh, Ryan Locker, who did these, um, a lot of these interviews with, with his other buddies at Agile Uprising, the really cool thing is there are huge gaps of memory, right? So it's kind of fascinating <laughs> that it was such a fluid group and, and um, so collaborative that, oh, yeah, I wonder... I wonder who came up with a, yeah, it's not that we don't like the things on the right in the sentence, it's just we like them less. Like, I don't know, Bob Martin thinks it was uh, Martin Fowler. I don't know, I don't remember, you know, and because, you know, and then Ward Cunningham, I mean, I remember that's when I first learned about Wiki, because he invented Wiki, and he used his Wiki later on to do like the 12 principles and stuff like that. I was like, oh, this is a cool Wiki, huh, how about that? That's a neat thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, was, I, can, I, was, I can write pages on this. Exactly. And I think it was like the first one in the world, if I, if I had to guess. And Ward said, yeah, I'll put up a web page. Oh, that's a good idea. Huh. Didn't think of that. <laughs> right? And we did like, none of this was planned, nor did we have an inkling that any, anybody would care. And then he says something like, oh, what, what if we put up a, a place where people can sign it, you know, like, Hey, yeah, I believe in this. This is cool. And you know, that, so that really took off tens of thousands. I, I don't even know how many we eventually took it, took off the signing. Cause it's like, all right, I think enough people signed it, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, none of it was planned or expected. Well, John, that brings us to the perfect place to introduce the next question for you. And that is tell us, let's take a minute or two. Uh, and, and, uh, even more readers digest than the last one a minute or two about what you've seen in the world 
since the explosion of the Agile Manifesto and over the last 20 years. Wow. Yeah, so, so th that's a funny picture because that's sort of my... Um, let, let me share that again so everybody can observe it. My, de my defense mechanism, what I'll often say is some of the things you see out there in the real world makes me want to just go, go do like yoga or something. It's like, oh my God, how, do, how are you possibly working like this? How did it go from something relatively simple to this huge complex mess? Um, so yeah, it's the, I guess the good, especially when I've gone to um, non-US conferences, when I've gone around the world and spoken and things like that, um, whether it's Greece or India or Colombia or um, it, I, you can really tell you that it, it impacts people. I mean, people come up and they're just so thankful that it, it's like you, I don't know, maybe that's what the, the, the folks in America felt when, when they read the Declaration of Independence, right? It was like, oh, yeah. I can take more ownership. I, I can be somewhat free. I, I, I can work under different, different um, state of mind, you know, I, and it really, that's the best thing I think is millions of people, you know, I, I think we're emboldened and lifted up and realized that it doesn't have to be the, the way, you know, it might've been. And on the flip side, you know, it certainly crossed the chasm. Well, John, that is, well, that, you know, first of all, it's amazing how that story mirrors that of hip hop, you know? Um, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> furthermore, when it comes to uh, that, that jumping the chasm part, that's what brought you out of it, right? Like at one point, Agile just became a, a, a shibboleth to beat people with and you were done. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Out. You're right. It's, it's like, all right, I'm done trying to save the world because you yeah. know, there's so, you know so much agile in name on it, um, and you know nothing wrong from at all. But you no, know, it, 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 it's the. I had a little a little challenge with using the term ma you know master because I'm thinking apprentice and master and you know from machining and things like that. Right, you got. Um, tool makers, right? You, you definitely have a, or, or back in the days of guilt, you know, you, you had apprentices and you learned a craft and you, and that ain't happening in two days, right? I mean, I think our, 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 our son's a machinist and I believe to actually work your way through that, it's, I think it might be eight years. I mean, it's no joke. And, no. and, it, and it's signed, it's like logged, it's proven. So, you know, I always had a little, but hey, it's just like any degree. Does it mean anything? I don't know. It might, but it, 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 it is what it is. So I always felt a little like, all right, but hey, you know, it's a free country. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, <laughs> Indeed. That so that, you know, that, that kind of, um, you know, on, on, the, on the other hand, it probably gave a lot of business analysts who probably wondered, what do we do now? A lot of roles were sort of suddenly no longer needed. Um, but yeah, you know, there's there's good and bad with it, and and the jumping the the chasm kind of it made me realize that um, you know there, there's there's sometimes these just overwhelming momentum and force forces that you know you're not going to change, and I, so I just went and worked with smaller teams and had a lot more fun, <laughs> make bigger impacts, and um, you know, I was like, all right, whatever. Call me when you're when you figure out that it, that agile in name only doesn't work because it doesn't. No, no, no. There it is. Now your return to the agile world, um, or one of the the many returns that, or not. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Either way, um, one of the things that you have been stressing in your work at Adaptivist is how to you apply the agile principles to the JIRA administration. You, you've called it colorfully how to unfuck JIRA, right? How to just unscrew the lid or how to go agile for JIRA success if you're uh, watching from the family. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, that's awkward. Um, so 
tell us why the Jira admins of the world need their own manifest, Agile manifesto. Yeah, so that, there, there's actually a, a, a summit talk that got turned into a webinar because of COVID. Some title with that, that kind of a title, except not with all the funny things. Um, and not <laughs> letters, I think just with asterisks or something. But, but yeah, what I realized is, you know, I was constantly, I've been using Jira since, I, I don't even remember. I, I just know whenever I probably discovered it, maybe early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, so for you a long used, time, You used Jira before it was cool. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I kind of cut my teeth on, you know, Star Team and then some other tracker, I forget what. But, you know, things that are kind of, might still be around, but, but then, and even the wiki, you know, when Confluence came up, because I think I'd use other crappy wikis, um, like sort of free wiki, so I was always rounding for money for tools. Um, so I've been using it for a long time, and it pisses me off. I'm going to say a lot of agilistas. You know, I guess they're too cool to use Jira or something. Um, and a lot of them get, you know, a lot of people bash it. And I always defend it because it ain't the freaking tool. Now, it might be a tool using the tool. Uh, <laughs> hey, all right. You know, and I don't want to. You know, but but yes, yeah, so that, that whole talk is trying to appeal to your admins that whether you know it or not, or think of it this way, you're building software. You have customers. I, I think there's a manifesto out there that talks about how you might want to consider working and that and you know talk to your customers, collaborate. Um, Produce working software, small iterations, right? Don't come out with this giant freaking workflow that just buries the users into a, a mind numbing. Like I walked into, a, I remember a famous mapping company that does those maps, you know, that you can get on screens and it shows- Like on the wall and stuff? No, like in online. Oh. Yeah, so like, G, you know, GIS stuff for, for you know, like, like what Google Maps does and those kinds of maps. Oh, oh, okay. So like internet maps, not, yeah. not you know, maps to put pins in. Okay, fine. Virtual pins. Both are cool, whatever. Yeah, so you know, I saw some weird things going on in the stand-up. I saw, you know, and, and then I went to you know, check out the Jira stuff. And the developer couldn't even move anything, right? The, the permissions were screwed up. It was a cluster. I'm like, huh. This is freaking worthless, right? I mean, it, like it just stopped the ability for them to do their work, and I and I was consulting with the some you know agile transformation some group that was rolling this out, and I went back into the war room that was you know the group's room, and I and I you know this was back before I was gentle, and I come in. <laughs> Go I, on, I, <laughs> sorry. I can't believe what I just saw, and you know so I bitched about it and it's like man i don't know how this happened but it's and then some guy sheepishly stands up in the corner and you know i said oh that was me i said ah what why'd you make it like totally unusable he goes well we've never used Jira before so i thought i put controls on i'm like that's even worse <laughs> like <laughs> let, let it run for a while just use the defaults and see you know like change a few things but but yeah so it's it, it was that experience plus a few others where where it's not the tool's fault, it's the ad, it's the admin who configured it in, into like being horrible. Yeah, configured it to death. Yeah, so there, that whole webinar, that whole talk is is trying to help express ways that Jira admins or Confluence or anything like that is you're building software. It's no joke. You just happen to have a pretty good head start with Jira, but you're still building software and treat it as such because. You can win hearts and minds if you do a good job and you can be, you know, a, a bad guy in the company or a bad girl, you know, like you're making our lives miserable. The villain. Now, John, you did say that we would have to talk to people. Are you absolutely sure about this? Well, I will say that's, I mean, the, that's the worst part of software development. I'll say. The people. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> It's Humans are the worst part of everything, man. Yeah, it would be a lot easier. 
So yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, you might want to actually sit down and you know negotiate, have some conversations around exactly, and ask the questions above what they're asking for. A lot of times they'll come to you with what they think you need to know because they're going to put it in your turn. Oh, I think I need a workflow status that does this, and you know, with sixty-seven you know ways out, and in. So yeah, you need to help solve the problems by asking questions and figuring out what are you really trying to do, and, and you might have a better solution than what yeah, they're I, uh, One of the things that I was insistent on back in the days when I did training was, you know, it's not set it and forget it. It can change. It's got to work for people, not people work for it. John? That brings us to the, my last question. Hopefully, if you have questions for John in the audience, they, please add them to the chat and we will get to them right after John takes this last question. So add some questions in the chat. But while you're doing that, John, can the Agile Manifesto be replaced? Can it be dethroned as the, uh, the greatest philosophy of work ever in all time? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that, that's a fun question though probably get all the time like would you change anything would you know would you add something to it and of course the short answer is no <laughs> no because i do believe that you know if you look at it 20 years later it doesn't look any older um it really and, and this is stated with all due humility uh but I, I think of it as an analogy that you know the declaration of independence got to the like the essence of governing people and and you know that a lot of that is just human it, it doesn't change and i think same thing with the manifesto it got to the essence of you know pieces of about the world and realm you know it's narrow about software development it's not like we're trying to solve you know a, a, a bigger problem but in that narrow domain i think we we nailed the essence and we left the wiggle room in there. Yeah, yeah. You gave yourself enough room to go either. Like it could be debated in the future. Some archaeologists, you know, way down the road, find your website. I mean, unlike the U.S. Constitution, we didn't allow for amendments. You know, so we're not doing any of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it was a confluence of strange. I don't say bedfellows, but that that whatever that word would be, the strange. Um, birds of a feather. Yeah, birds of a feather. Yeah. Happened once. Will never happen again. Well, it might, but not not these seventeen people. Um, so no, I wouldn't change it, and I think it stands the test of time. You just need to understand what it's really about, and don't get faked out by you know faux agile. Yep, yep, right on. Well, J John Kern, thank you so much. I want to open it up to questions from the audience. So I don't see anything in the chat just yet. But if you'd like to unmute and ask John a question, let's try and not step on each other's toes too much. Dilip, you had some so a fantastic question for John. I think you should just unmute and ask it. It was so good. John, Dilip's like been, he's got a great question for you. <laughs> you know, first as, as a comment, John, I think I find fascinating is that you mentioned that uh, it was messy, where you know people are getting different ideas. Because I think people would assume that, hey, this is it. This is what happened, right? It's always great to hear kind of how the, I guess, how the sausage is made. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's amazing that the evolution uh, that you did come to that consensus. Uh, that's pretty amazing. That's a good, that's a great point. Because yeah, if you researched all the different um, processes, I mean, there was some. You know, even just along the axis of uh, how long should a sprint be, you know, oh, well, it should be months or this, you know, there, there was some crazy, um, I, I would say, you know, almost diametrically opposed ideas. So you're right. That, that's a really good observation that somehow, I think because of the genius of the this versus that, it's not that we don't, you know, it's that, that, that wiggle room, that that embracing of we don't know it all, that embracing of it's not black, black and white, it's not A or B, it's not left or right, it's not, you know, this way or the highway, pick your favorite phrase. It's, it's um, a variation that suits the context in which you have to apply. And so you're right, it was, it is kind of fascinating that we were able to come to any kind of consensus with all those, especially with all those egos in the room. And they really mostly were left at the door, I will say. You know, I, I 
spoke a lot. And you know, I'm a junior to a lot of those people, at the, at the, especially at the time. But nobody thought any different. It was pretty cool. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> and, I have uh, a question there. Oh, please. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Maru, go ahead, man. Go um, ahead. Sure. Uh, again, a great presentation, great insights on what exactly happened on that day. Um, so, John, uh, tell us, like, when you guys were brainstorming on what this should be and how this should look, was there any point in time, like, when you guys were discussing, like, you reached a point, like, everyone was not uh, agreeing into it, getting into a fist fight or something like that at any point? Um, there, I would say maybe the, 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 the one, the, the one member that was there was maybe the most oddball. That was Stephen Mellon, because he was uh, he was probably the most businessy person there in some sense, because he was into executable UML models, and like you know, a lot of people were like, "All right, yeah, keep smoking that pipe," uh, you know. So I think I don't know, but if I had to guess, he might, we might have made the most fun of him. <laughs> Come on, Steve. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, so, but I would say that um, there, there really wasn't any, like probably almost in any other venue there, there with those kind of people in the room, it, there might have been, I don't want to say, you know, fisticuffs, but you're right, there, it's kind of shocking that, that there wasn't any huge arguments or debates, because it, it was trying to synthesize, well, What's common about all of our methods that's working? Because we know the the big heavyweight stuff ain't working. That's just stupid to do a lot of that crap. So, what can we do to help expose what's working for us and synthesize it? So, I think that might have been the secret to a bunch of people who know object-oriented principles, right? I mean, that's kind of what we do all day. If you're building software, it's, you know, it's abstract stuff. Maybe that helped. I had to guess. And John, you, you have a part of the story that, that I have really taken to heart and something you have mentioned down the road several times is that everyone, by the end of it, you had people who didn't really like each other all that much um, trying to finish each other's sentences, getting their thought bubbles to look like they were looking at the same thing. Yeah, that's another good point where, because it really was um, trying to seek to understand versus seek to get my message out. It was, it, it, I think there was actually, a, maybe somebody said something in the beginning, if I had to guess. I, I keep coming back to thinking that Martin was a kind of an MC. He was sort of an unbiased neutral party. He didn't have a, you know, I'm FDD, Kent and his squad were XP, right? Martin was like, I, I ain't picking sides. <laughs> and I just seem to remember him being really good facilitator maybe he said things early on about uh, setting the stage right because you can do that when you have we you know certainly when we try to consult with teams and you try to get that that level of comfort in the room you know you, you there are some techniques you can use to say you know help people get their ideas out so you can understand with the bubble above their head the thought balloons and, you know don't try to get your you know don't impose yourself on there just try to ask questions to get it out so um, I think you're right. That's probably um, somehow it was what actually happened, and I don't remember why. It was magic. That's all. Magic. There you go. All right, everybody. John Kern, thank you so much. The floor, guys, and thank you from Adaptivist. We really well, appreciate well, I, it. Sorry, I have one more question for John. If, if, if that's have that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, so John, I, one of the questions I have, obviously, it, it's interesting you mentioned that obviously things haven't changed. You know, we don't want to add anything. But it's interesting, 20 years later, like the tools have changed, the technology has changed, right? But the process, you know, you're saying is, 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 is still there, you know, should be follow the agile principles. And obviously people, well, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how much people have changed, but, but I'm curious if you can kind of make some comments on that, how that agile has stayed, but everything else is kind of around us has, has been evolving. That's another good question. Um, yeah, so I, I'd say another aspect of, of this, this gathering was, you know, I don't know, most of them probably hadn't, were, were thinking mostly around smaller teams, right? So, so there was never anything about 
scaling or you know so a lot of that stuff has come since the lean the less the more the you know the the safe the dad the, <laughs> all the other stuff um you know I, I think frankly the the most root problems can be brought back to the agile manifesto because again i think it, it hits at the core and all the rest is just noise right Safe is an, is an attempt, frankly, to, um, I think, I, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but in my mind, that's, I, I would approach solving, as an engineer, I tend to decompose, right? So my, my, my approach to a giant project is to make them into 10 smaller projects and then and, and get really s slick about architecting, you know, design by interface and all that kind of stuff. And I ain't doing a hundred per, you know, like, that stuff kind of just makes my head hurt um, because I think agile is easy, easier to grasp. All that other stuff is, is, is making things more complicated and requiring giant diagrams. I, I don't know. So um, I think that's why agile in the small still applies 20 years later and, and everything else is just, oh, one thing I will say, it's a lot easier 20 years later to do the right thing. It's a lot easier to, to get those those tight feedback loops all the way from whether you're doing unit tests to you know, TDD to BDD to rapid deploys multiple times a day, right? I mean, there's no excuse not to be doing things in a fairly kick-ass way because it's not like you have to invent stuff now. Back then, yeah, you had to do a lot more work to get something out on a server. Today, hell, I, I, I run uh, like a side project that for firefighters and stuff like that and and i can do it all and it you know these these tools are ubiquitous now so i think there's even less excuse to not be agile thank you he means I you do. folks <laughs> well that that was that was really amazing thank thank you john for taking us through all this journey and thank you ryan for coordinating so well <laughs> That was the best MC in Grand. I don't know how you do that. How do you manage to do that? Yeah. So here's the trick, Madhu. It's it's serve food, serve food, sunshine. <laughs> That's all you got to do, man. Every time. Yeah, you're pretty neat. Good yeah. job, man. Well, so I take it like no more questions, I believe. Uh, not even in the chat. So. I think uh, we can move to the to the last segment of the uh, event. And are you guys able to see my screen? Uh, hold on. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. It's a beautiful painting, though. Uh, okay. I think I had shared the. It looks like a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> How about now? Yeah. You see my screen? Yeah, we see it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. So uh, this is the last segment, which is uh, the, the raffles. That's always, uh, we always thank our, all our sponsors for that. And thank you at Tech Adaptivist and Columns uh, for sponsoring the gift cards today. Uh, just a note that these raffle are, I mean, people who are eligible are just the members, so not expert partners and not a classian. So all we have to do right now, so we have uh, four cards total today, four raffle prizes. Uh, the two uh, $25 gift cards from Column, uh, 150 and 150 from EdTech and Adaptivist. So uh, here are the names. Uh, in case uh, anybody who's here, and if you don't, if you are just a member and you don't see your name, just ping uh, either speak up or uh, ping your name uh, in the chat. Uh, also, one thing is like if you if you get picked up here, please 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 do send the email right away. Uh, in the chat so that we can uh, just assign you to our partners and they can just send you uh, your prizes directly. So without further ado, I'm just gonna spin this wheel and let's see. Correct, thank you. All right, do we have Sergi? Let's see. Hey. <laughs> hey, yeah, cool. Congratulations. So can you please uh, send uh, your email address in the chat? 
And so this this gift this raffle was for the, I'm sorry I didn't mention earlier it was the Uber gift card from Column. So um, I think if somebody's there from Column, can you please note down the email address and uh, hand over the gift card? Um, and the second prize also we're gonna take the same uh, the Uber gift card. So now I'm gonna spin it for the second prize the second Uber gift card. And that's Stella. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, do we have her here? Well, we lost the music here, folks. A couple, but all right. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's, that's unfortunate. There's, there's like nice music always comes. Um, okay, let's see. But do we have Stella here? Anything on the chat? We can catch up. I don't see Stella on there, but okay. she's still. All right, we'll have to uh, find that out then. <clears throat> so I'll just respin it. Um, yeah, I think we should respin it uh, because I think we had previously mentioned that right, right, the right. winner has to be around. So yeah, unfortunately, right. because I mean the big uh, just to give everyone a background. Uh, the reason being is we need to get the email ID. Um, there is no other way we can get it out. So that's one of the reasons why we are insisting that we need to have you around to that's share your email ID. I think last time we had a very bad experience. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna respin it for the Uber Eats uh, gift card. Uh, for thirty dollars. Howard. <laughs> All right, so that's gonna be Howard, and I think he's there. No, okay, acknowledged. All right, Howard, I think. You don't need to give, you know, or maybe you can give it there and then uh, uh, you can reach out there. Congratulations. All right, the next prize is for uh, the $1.50 Visa gift card from EdTech. So, <laughs> all right. Okay, fine. So I'm just going to spin the wheel again. And good luck, everyone. And let's see who's the winner for $1.50 gift card from EdTech. And it's Herschel. Do we have Herschel here? Congratulations, Herschel. Okay, so he's there. Congratulations. Just please do provide your email address. All right. So now, at last, but you. So at last, we are having a dollar fifty gift card from Adaptivist. And let's see to whom it goes to. Woo! <laughs> so that's gonna be John. Hey. Congratulations, John. <laughs> it's not rigged. I think, no, no, John is not here. Can we move on? Like, hey. hello, John. He's not here. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I live very close to John. I can hand over the gift card to him. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the pictures, John, of me celebrating that gift card. <laughs> oh, that was cold. <laughs> I'm just going to point out, that was cold, Matty. Okay, I know where he lives. <laughs> great, great. Congratulations to all the winners uh, again. And uh, really thank you for all the sponsors for providing and uh, giving these gift cards to all the people. And uh, we'll coordinate in case uh, Mr. Provider Invitation there. We'll be coordinate. Uh, once again, uh, thanks everyone for for coming into this virtual event. Don't forget, next event is on July 30th, and that's when we're gonna have another interesting session over there. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is like wrap up of the event from our side, but we definitely wanna keep it continue in case people are interested in talking through just chit chat. It's like like virtual APR thing. So we'll keep this line open. I'll definitely stop the recording, but we'll keep this line open for people to just 
talk and chit chat about here and also in case if you have any questions for for all our expert partners so i i'm sure they they won't hesitate to answer your questions so uh, with that said once again thank you and let's continue our chit chat as like virtual happy hours that's a good question in the uh in the chat trina oh. asks yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's like uh, definitely we are recording this. So uh, what we do all the time is uh, we do upload this to our YouTube channel and then we share it. So uh, when if you go back to our our uh, Atlassian community page, there you're gonna see the pictures now, not no real picture, but what we take the screenshots along with the presentations, uh, what we have here and uh, the video. Mm -hmm. So if you check back like in a couple of days, probably early next week, you should be finding all this information over there and you will be able to watch this presentation right there. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free. All, uh, all leads are here, all expert partners are here. So we can continue uh, on this. Right, Pleasure you. being here, everybody. Great to see your faces. Really nice to see some smiles, but I gotta take off and eat some dinner. Here's <laughs> because there's no sushi.